this is the lithium price. You can see that it really took off in 2015 and it peaked in 2018. Now, part of the reason for that was because there was a massive supply in elasticity argument that there was this growing demand for batteries and that there simply wasn't enough of lithium around to supply the market. And that continued until about 2018. Now, it's worth remembering that when it comes to building a new significant, globally significant mining operation, it generally takes about three years. And it's interesting that when the price broke out in the middle of 2015, it peaked three years later because a great deal of new supply came onto the market. Now, we have definitely seen that the demand for batteries has picked up considerably in the intervening period since the peak in lithium prices and it is likely to continue to trend higher. We're coming back to a point now where lithium as it is currently priced is getting to be uneconomic and that means that supply will get shut in and we're we don't have clear evidence yet that the price has bottomed, but it's coming back to an interesting area around 100. And we know that there is a clear demand driver. One reason why Tesla has been doing well, most particularly over the course of just the last week, has been because they beat all expectations for supplies and there were more sales than anyone was really expecting. Now, part of the reason for that was because their uh, Chinese factories kept on producing batteries, kept on producing cars, and they were able to sell more in China, and not least because they've cozied up with the authorities there, and also China is further along in combating the coronavirus. One thing that I think is particularly relevant is oil. Now, let's just think for a moment about what happens when oil prices decline. Obviously, the price goes down, and it means that gasoline prices go down. People then have more money in their pockets. But the more important point is that when the price of a vital commodity goes down a lot, then it creates a demand cycle all on its own because people will come up with new ways to use whatever that commodity is in order to capture the economic value. And that's exactly what's happening with lithium. Lithium prices are contracting. The price of batteries is falling and the number of use cases for batteries continues to increase. Well, the most obvious way of thinking about that is in electric vehicles. The naysayers will talk your ear off about the fact that battery uh, technology is still in its infancy, that the number of internal combustion engines on the road is something that is uh, it's, the, it's so large, it's insurmountable. But the reality is that lithium prices at today's levels are making batteries cheaper. When you start to think about the running costs of a an electric vehicle versus a, an internal combustion engine, then they're almost on a par right now. When you start to think about the fact that Tesla is now engaging with fleet managers for corporate uh, travel fleets and that electric vehicles, particularly the Model 3, is coming out very much in a more economic, in economically favorable manner than internal combustion engines, then you can definitely think about the fact that we're going to have more electric vehicles on the road. Not everybody needs to drive 500 miles in a day. There will be batteries that will deliver that. But the more important point, and it is something that is truly transformational for the battery sector, is very simple. The one thing that was holding back the evolution of the market for electric vehicles more than anything else was 
the way that the batteries were losing charge so that you were paying top dollar for your car and within three or four years it was virtually worthless because the batteries could no longer hold a charge. That meant that the resale value on electric vehicles was some of the worst for any vehicle on the road. Now Tesla is on the cusp of releasing a million mile battery. It means that you can drive that battery for a million miles, potentially as much as 20 years, and that it will only lose 5% of its charging capacity. Now, once that is released, the economics of owning an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine will be truly revolutionized because your battery driven car could be the only car you would ever need and the technology will obviously continue to improve but the evolution of the million mile battery is something that is truly groundbreaking and it is one of the reasons why oil prices are likely to continue to remain low relative to the peaks put in back in 2011 and 12, because the only time commodity prices aren't truly cyclical and move in big peak to trough swings is when you have clear evidence of substitution. And that is one of the reasons why copper excuse me, cobalt, has not been recovering. And the price is still back exactly where it was before the big move higher in 2016 and 2017. So this is significant because the constituent metals that go into what everyone thinks of as batteries are not rising. It means that the trend of lower battery prices can continue. The other, I think, extremely important point is that natural gas is very low and it is giving us some evidence of steadying, but it's still trading below $2. Now, we're only looking at 10 years of history here. We need to look at a lot more history in order to get a really clear idea of just how low the natural gas price is today because it is one of the few commodities that gave up the entire advance from the commodity bull market and came all the way back down to the lows put in in the 1990s. One thing that we know is that there is a great deal of natural gas. Rules have changed recently in Texas to limit the amount of time that and the number of days on which natural gas can be flared off. They're going to have to come up with ways to capture it. But that also means there's going to be even more gas coming to the market. Now, just like any other commodity, it is like Economics 101. When you have a vital economic commodity that falls to historic lows, people will come up with a new way to use it. Now, we've talked a little about the battery sector and range in terms of competition with internal combustion engines. But the reality is that when we are then moving outside of uh, the domestic vehicle, thinking more about haulage vehicles, or uh, the much bigger trucks, or planes, or major uh, ships, then batteries are alone just not going to get it done. And that's why we're likely to see a hydrogen economy evolve. And the enabling factor for that is low natural gas prices. Eventually, we're going to get to a point where we will be able to develop hydrogen supply networks that are not reliant on fossil fuels. But it is virtually a certainty that the entire sector is going to be heavily reliant on the natural gas price 
for the foreseeable future. And the number of shares we have in the hydrogen sector is comparatively small, but they are rallying in a very robust fashion. But what is perhaps more important than that is that they're at new highs. And when we think about the fact that they have been rallying against a background of one of the most uncertain periods in history, then there is definitely something going on that is really very important. Because we have got a small number of shares, but the commonality that we have is really outstanding. And these types of companies have had big bull markets before. Plug Power traded at $1,600 back in 1999. It's still below 10 today. So when we start to think about what the potential is, what we could potentially think of as a really big bull market, I think it is clear that we're only really in the foothills and that the volatility that we're seeing today is nothing compared to what we may see in the future. Then let's look at the solar sector. There was, I think, impressive news in here today for Sunrun. They have just bought their biggest rival and the market rewarded them with a very significant jump on the upside. But the much more important uh, characteristic is that not just one company, but the entire solar ETF is back in the region of the peaks from back in 2014 and 15. It is massively outperforming the oil price and the natural gas price. When we then think about the wind sector, well, then we're also looking at significant outperformance. Now, you don't get outperformance for no reason. There is a clear rationale for why there should be a clear outperformance by renewables. One is that they are becoming progressively more uh, viable in terms of their uh, business models. There are a number of reasons for that. The first is technological innovation. The second is that you're getting more market penetration. Then on top of that, there is wider acceptance of the need for more renewable energy and not least because of the worries about climate change. But then you also have direct government support and carbon credit prices are now back at their peak. There is a clear intention to ensure that there is a tailwind for renewables from governments and the creation of what is effectively an artificial market in carbon is something that is directly aimed at ensuring that there is a level playing field for renewables. What it really suggests is that we are moving progressively more towards a less fossil fuel de uh, dependent developed world. Now, we are still going to see massive investments in coal-fired power stations in places like China and India and emerging markets because they are more worried about the clear need for energy independence. And it is a geopolitical decision to continue with those uh, very highly polluting stations. That is not going to change until technology has improved to an incontrovertible advantage over coal. And we're just not there yet, but we're going to get there. And sharing technology with places like India is going to be one of the clearest advantages that can be gained for the entire planet. But the other point, of course, is that with the innovation we're seeing in technology, with the lowering of prices for the basic requirements to unhook from the grid, 
then what we are in fact seeing is a revolution. And it is just one of many revolutions that are taking place right now. But it is clearly one that we can monitor in the stock market. And therefore, we have plenty of evidence and tools with which to benefit from it. I think with that, I'll leave you for today. And I'll wish all the best to all of you.